Welcome to Open 2020 for day two. Uh, it's very exciting to have you all back here. Uh, we had a really good day yesterday. We had, uh, I think, up to 70 people online at the same time at one point. And we didn't actually manage to bake Big Blue Button, our new open source video conferencing platform brought to us by meet.coop. Um, so all in all, it was a success. We had some failures with some of the other software that we tried to experiment with, but that's all part of the learning journey. So I wanted to start today's conference by emphasizing the fact that cooperation will win. Ultimately, we live in a very competitive society at the minute. And I don't personally think that's always going to be the case. And I was really, really um, excited and interested and impressed when I read this book by Matt Ridley, who clearly knows an awful lot about genetics um, and those types of things. And this book is basically builds on um, the kind of selfish gene theory um, in order to prove that in fact genes aren't being selfish because uh, selfishness is the way of the world. Genes are being selfish because they want themselves and their species to live. And Matt Ridley goes a long way to explaining lots of things about genetics, um, which are really interesting. But he also talks about cooperation. He talks about cooperation in terms of the prisoner's dilemma. So just in case that you don't know what the prisoner's dilemma is, it's um, a kind of hypothetical story in which two prisoners are stuck in a jail and they're both trying to get out. And if they cooperate with each other, like whatever it is they're doing, there's various different versions of this story, but it might be that they're digging a tunnel together in order to get out. And if they both cooperate, <clears throat> You could say that they, if they were digging a tunnel, uh, they both escape. Whereas I think in this example here that we have on screen, they must just be both be being good in order that they only serve one year. But then one of them is doing something dodgy or the other one's doing something dodgy. Um, and then one of them tells on the other, that is the betrays model. So if B betrays A, then A serves three years, but B goes free and vice versa, meaning that it is actually good it's better to betray somebody if your opponent, if as it were, or partner is going to tell the truth. However, if both of you betray each other, then you both suffer the consequences. So Grace is saying it's all about them being interrogated before going into jail, not about digging a tunnel. I think there's multiple versions of this story, but the the point is that it has been used, this story has been used in order to try and um, explain and provide a model whereby we can look at different types of behavior. So if you put uh, these different types of behavior into a computer, then what you will see is that when you play this game once or twice, and you know you're only going to play once or twice, it makes sense to defect. It makes sense to try and rip off the other player and to just get out with the highest score you can, um, no matter what's going to happen to the other player. However, if you know that you're going to play this game again and again and again and again, it makes no sense to rip off the other player because if you both cooperate on an ongoing basis, you get uh, better results. What this determines is that who you are playing with and knowing the person you're playing with makes a really big difference. And this has big uh, analogies for cooperation in society and the way that things work. Through the book, Matt Ridley goes on to explain all the different strategies that have been invented and how these have been programmed into a computer and let to run indefinitely to see which wins. So to start with, there's a, a strategy called tit for tat, which is if somebody um, defects, then the next time the other person will defect and then they kind of resolve back to trying to be cooperative. And as things evolve, you see that there are various strategies which beat other strategies and force them into non-existence. And actually, as things evolve and different strategies develop, you see that actually the cooperative strategies do succeed in the long run, but only after they've had slightly, um, it, it's a stepped process. So that basically, yeah, once you have uh, one strategy which is cooperating a little bit, a, co a strategy which cooperates a little bit more becomes the dominant strategy, wipes everything out, and eventually you end up in a situation where you have cooperative strategies ruling the roost. So I just wanted to read a few sections from Matt's book. 
um, which I think emphasized this point. And he says, by emphasizing that the challenge in the prisoner's dilemma game is to attract the right partner, he shows how reciprocators precipitate out of society, leaving the selfish rationalists to their fate. And once cooperators segregate themselves off from the rest of society, a wholly new force of evolution can come into play, one that pits groups against each other rather than individuals. So I think this is a really interesting point in relation to what we were discussing yesterday and for meet.coop. Um, we were talking to Yasser about the advantage of economies of scale <clears throat> and coalescing around a single platform and a service to deliver a need. And that's exactly what we've done here with meet.coop. That's the reason why we're able to talk to you on this video conferencing platform at the moment is because we've pulled our resources, we've cooperated to make this happen. And I think it's just one example of how our job now is to try and pull together different groups of people who agree that it makes sense to cooperate because by doing so we can ring fence ourselves, gain the advantages and grow our kind of commons infrastructure and our common society. There's a few more sections from Matt's book which I think are equally important. He also talks about the tragedy of the commons which is a tragedy itself. He says it is nonsense to argue that just because something is communally owned it must suffer the tragedy of the commons. Common property and open access free-for-alls are very different things. The old pre-inclusion English commons as a genuinely egalitarian place open to all is a nostalgic myth. So there he's really rubbishing the tragedy of the commons by Hardin and I think that's important to point out too because really what we are talking about here is not having a video conferencing platform which is available for anybody to log into at any time and use all of the bandwidth for free that would be a free-for-all and that's never going to work we'd all suffer really badly what we are talking about is ring fencing it and having some sort of maybe permeable or semi-permeable membrane around this commons so that we can all use it uh, as in we as in the people who have contributed and provided it and maybe some other people too but not as a free-for-all for everybody he goes on to talk about uh, virtue in society and how we can bring about greater virtue in society and he says if we are to recover social harmony and virtue if we are to build back in society the virtues that made it work for us it is vital that we reduce the power and scope of the state so this is something that Mike was talking about yesterday in his choice of tools, like what role should the state play? And I think he, he Matt Ridley here, has um, an interesting perspective. He says, that does not mean a vicious war of all against all. It means devolution, devolution of power over people's lives to parishes, computer networks, clubs, teams, self-help groups, small businesses. Everything is small and local. It means a massive disassembling of the public bureaucracy Personally, that's what I've kind of been championing um, yeah, for the whole of the conference and for the whole of the time Open Co-op has been set up. I massively agree with those statements and hope that other people do here too. He says, let national and international governments wither into the minimal function of national defense and redistribution of wealth directly without an intervening and greedy bureaucracy. Let Crop de Crin's vision of a world of free individuals return. Let everybody rise up in full by their reputation. I'm not so naive as to think this can happen overnight or that some form of government isn't necessary, but I do question the necessity of a government that dictates the minutest of detail of life and squats like a giant flea on the back of the nation. Well, that seems quite relevant um, since what's just happened with COVID. But the final bit that I wanted to emphasize um, that comes out of this book, The Origins of Virtue, which I do recommend you read before you write Matt Ridley off, um, is that he talks about trade and about how trade in the old days when countries were still discovering each other, that actually trade was the means by which they got to know each other. So they used to fight and, and battle and try and kill each other and then they would find each other's remnants of each other's weapons afterwards realize that maybe these other tribes and bands had um, materials and goods that they didn't have and then realize that it might be nicer to trade with them rather than try to kill them so from that conclusion Matt Ridley um, kind of yeah moves on to posit the theory that basically trade is a means by which we build up cooperation. He says, 
the roots of social order are in our heads where we possess the instructive capacity for creating not a perfect harmonious and virtuous society but a better one than we have at present we must build our institutions in such the way that they draw out these instincts well that's exactly what we're trying to do here he says preeminently this means the encouragement of exchange between equals just as trade between countries is the best recipe for friendship between them, so exchange between enfranchised and empowered individuals is the best recipe for cooperation. We must encourage social and material exchange between equals, for that is the raw material of trust, and trust is the foundation of virtue. So that's probably more than enough of Matt Ridley, but the point I wanted to make is that it sounds like what he's talking about there is trade. And if you think about what we've been talking about in our mutual uh, credit sessions, we're trying to build trust in order to create trusting economies. Then that does emphasize the fact that maybe we should start trying to trade in mutual credit a bit more. Maybe just the simple act of reciprocating and providing some goods or services for somebody in exchange for some credit and then doing that for somebody else in reverse would provide a better foundation for virtue to evolve between us, even in our small cooperative world, which then might spread slightly further and wider. I just wanted to point to this last lovely visual slide because I think it emphasizes all of that in spades. Basically, what I got out of yesterday is that we can do so much more when we work together. If we carry on trying to tinker and work on our own, then we really are not going to be successful and we will continue to be eaten by the big fish. We will be picked off one by one and we will never succeed. However, if we were to coordinate in order to then potentially collaborate and then ultimately to cooperate, we would do much better as a team. So that said, I would like to bring you uh, back again to talk to Esther Foreman from the Social Change Agency. I just wanted to chat with Esther now and give her a bit of space to actually tell you about what she has been doing, because I think it builds on what I was just saying about um, building trust and virtue, because part of what Esther's been doing has been setting up through the Social Change Agency, setting up and helping manage lots of these mutual aid groups, which have been um, developing in the UK since the COVID disaster as a support for the COVID response. Morning, everyone. Hi, Oliver. Good morning. Great. Morning. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> nice introduction. Um, when I hear you say we have loads of um, mutual aid groups, it's a, it, we're just all exhausted. <laughs> it's been three months of a lot of work and hearing you say say that it, it really gives me pause for how much my team have worked without question to help thousands across the UK so yeah I'm very proud of them. Uh, you should be when we we heard from Amy in our webinar and um, she showed the open collective page with all the list of all of the groups all around the UK because it is very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> So my, my background is actually in the large charity sectors. I was a campaigner and campaigns director at MENCAP and the Learning Disability Coalition. So I'm seeped in social justice and campaigning and, and comms. Um, and actually my career started at the RISE um, digital campaigning. So I remember right at the beginning when um, it, well, you could first email and lobby your MP that way. So I was definitely contributed towards the tsunami of um of digital techniques for campaigning which i then later critiqued heavily um through my research uh, when i did my claw leadership program um, because i definitely felt that the uh, rise in digital campaigning had uh, somewhat polluted the well of democracy with our um with our kind of elected officials um and worked hard to to restore the trust that we'd seen that had been broken in that. Um, but going right back to the beginning, my um, I started out doing a PhD on charismatic leaderships in cults um, at the London School of Economics. And I spent a good uh, amount of years looking at a cult in Watford um, and didn't finish my PhD, but understood exactly really uh, first-hand experience of where 
um, toxic leadership and really bad group dynamics, where, what happens when it goes horribly wrong. Um, and actually between that and then my work in the charity sector, I recognised about 2000 and, um, 2011 that things needed to shift. And actually in order for uh, social change to be achieved um, in, in the modern world, which it sounds terrible, but actually understanding that technology has changed the way um, the social contract exists between the citizen and the state, the charity sector was very behind. Um, and uh, we, I wanted to build a, an agency that helped bridge that. Um, and in doing that, understanding that the way that power was going to be shifted was through a networked approach. It was through proper movement building, which is not about hierarchies, not about um, sort of concentrations of power in organisations, but actually it's going to be with and through people um, spread out. Um, fast forward to now, and um, I think I was right. <laughs> um, and there's the women definitely seeing a shift um the, an almost like a dismantling of power um between state and um civil society and citizen-led work so um the social agency uh change agency itself we kind of got three strands to what we do and um, we support organizations and networks and businesses uh to build their own movements through consultancy um, we start movements where we think there are gaps. So we've just um, we've we started um, the Young Trustees movement, which aims to double the number of young trustees on boards of charities in the next ten years in England and Wales, um, which is really important to helping charities shift culture. Um, and then um, we set up Leading Control, which is a network of about six seven hundred people now who are interested in the shifts that happen when you start to let go of control and share power and um, that is cross sector um and in addition to that we fiscally host um movements and networks and this is where the open collective work came from and see another thing so this um fiscal hosting isn't really a concept that's used widely in the uk uh, in america it's really standard um but over here not so much and um, this, it came to our attention about four or five years ago when we were commissioned by the Paul Hamlin Foundation to look at the Help Refugees movement and really understand how it just erupted so quickly. Um, and they wanted to know like what they could do as, um, what they could do uh, to help this in the future. And we know that um, for those that don't know the Help Refugees uh, movement, uh, it was started by four incredible young women from um, North London. Um, they were just all volunteers. They wanted to do something to help the um, uh, the French, um, the jungle in France. And um, they just wanted to like, maybe take some blankets down. So they set up a crowd funder and request for some blankets. And within a week, they had fundraised £50,000 and had an entire warehouse of stuff they like, donated. And, you know, fast forward... Um, two years later, they managed to raise two million. They'd got the only ones in the jungle doing the work. They were able to operationalize and mobilize faster than any other charity um, and did loads of um, loads of uh, kind of incredible work down there. Um, and we recognized that in, in all of that, the thing that they that was really pivotal to their success was they had a fiscal host. And what the fiscal host did was give them the uh, structures that it needed. Um, in order to to um, to scale, I suppose, and to scale impact, so bank account, trustees, um, other bits and pieces. And um, what we recognised was that um, they did all of that, but what they didn't do as fiscal hosts was also offer um, the governance support um, and the group support, strategic support, um, actually the the wiping of tissues, the emotional labour, you know, it's all wiping of tears with tissues. I mean, the emotional labour, cups of tea, um, hearing out frustrations, um, giving really good solutions to how you actually manage networks and movements. So we decided to build a, a nesting service for groups and movements that um, provides like a fiscal hosting plus. So we give them a bank account, um, we give them, um, we can share our insurance, or um, we've now set it up as a CIC, our CIC number, um, and 
and they've kind of so they've got protection and then we can give them the plus model so we can help them with loads of other stuff as well group dynamics decision making um crowdfunding um and you know anything they want that we can we can also offer that support we've also got trustees that can step in and out as temporary trustees um so all kinds of things and um, we started to um physically host and well, nest as we call it a number of movements called um we are currently working with um women's march global um we're currently working with uh the uh, school's climate strike network um so quite a few that come in and use our kind of infrastructure um and when we were always going to look at the open collective platform it was always in the in the pipeline to look at it the um the platform itself is brilliant the tools are brilliant um we really like tech it's come out of extinction rebellion so we know that the values are aligned to, to what our values are um and when COVID-19 hit you know it was like this is this is it this is all the learning that we've had from um the work we did on, with help refugees we know citizen-led responses to emergency crisis we know how this works and we have the tool in our hand to be able to stop what we saw happening again with help refugees so um things that we had noticed not just with the help refugees but with other kind of public crises london stabbings um, and so on is that people the, the potential for fraud is huge so people um you know were setting up crowdfunding sites that were run by people with fraudulent um ambitions um you know or they were raising loads of money and suddenly 60 grand was sitting in someone's personal bank account and they were freaking out about it and didn't want the responsibility um mm -hmm. or there were groups that were set up and then um you know the volunteers just sort of die away exhausted so um we 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 ran we literally sprinted and um, we did something that i've never seen done before which is launch tech product in three days and get it out without anyone like exploding or or <laughs> having a meltdown or anything else and i've done enough work in tech accelerators to know that that is that was no mean feat and my team i just it's kudos to them because they are fantastic um and so we we just got it out and we um we we pushed it out um and what was we wouldn't have been able to do it without um the trust of three foundations that literally phoned us up and said what do you need and we said we need this much money to get this out now and if they hadn't done it i don't think we would have been able to do it so it's it was a perfect storm for that perfect set of ingredients um, and what, and how did you find, sorry, the, yeah. the, the, the groups? I'm just wondering, because there's so many on here. You, I now see you're hosting, you're fiscally hosting 104 collectives. Yeah. How did they all find you or you find them? Yeah, absolutely. So I set mine up. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we're a, we're a busy, busy group of people at the Social Change Agency. A lot of us are, you know, we've all got side hustles um, and most of us are activists in our communities. So um, we went, you know, I set my Brent one up, um, my Wolves and Green one, and then across the Brent group. Um, and so we just, we just went for it. Um, and I know that the mutual aid, um, uh, mutual aid is uh, really um, connected. So you've got the Facebook groups, all the groups are on there. Um, it's, you know, it's mutual. So there's no kind of organizing committee. Um, but once one works, they tend to tell the other groups in their borough and their region. So we spread it out that way. And we had an outreach person that was on the phone and talking to people. And, you know, we didn't we didn't wait. I think that was it. We just didn't wait because we knew that this was what we, we knew that this was what was needed. And we knew that um, if we waited to test it and try it, it'd be too late. So we like just, we just literally went, fuck it, we're just going to do it. And we did it um, and suffer the consequences. But it looks now, if I look at the page and sort of take a rough average, I mean, I see the top, uh, the top group there has got 279 contributors and, you know, there's 30 odds at the one at the bottom. But like, I mean, if you average that all out, it's like you, you've, you've got about 10,000 people there or something who've all come yeah. together. Like that's incredible in a couple of months, like, and that is now quite a large stakeholder group, which I would say you could probably assume are quite values aligned with the kind of things that you're trying to do, the kind of things that we want to do. And are probably very interested in uh, ways to take this forward to do more and better and greater stuff. 
What, what yeah. plans do you have in that respect? <laughs> yeah, that's, good. that's a really good question. And we're thinking a lot about it at the moment. So uh, <laughs> what, what this um, Peace Tech has enabled us to do is work with foundations to get money right into the communities. So um, we were working with guys in St. Tommy's um, Charitable Trust in South London, and they've been able, we're using our um, community organizers and um, be able to get into literally postcode corridors in, um, in a particular area that say, for example, have high rates of heart disease or high rates of diabetes. And they know that if they could just get the community organized and get that level of support in through the mutual aid groups, it would take the pressure off social services, off the um, healthcare service, uh, all the public kind of services. So um, that's, they approached us to work with us to do that. So um, it's been, from that respect, it's been great. So what you're looking at um, on that platform isn't just 10,000 people, you're looking at over 200,000 pounds worth of aid that has gone in and gone out. Um, some of it is actually, that's not entirely true. Some of it is aid and some of it is bits of money for shopping, which isn't aid. It's just normal sort of like transactions where people have paid for stuff and received and been reimbursed. I guess it's in the wave of a public response to a crisis. Um, what, what we've seen is a quick emergency response. So volunteer mobilization, everyone's getting involved. Great. About six weeks, everyone gets exhausted. <laughs> and, you know, start to die out and it's like oh my god we've got another like volunteer meeting we've got you know people just get really really tired and then um after that the um the people that are going to be there for the longer t for longer term start to actually what have the kind of identity questions what are we doing what's this for where are we going so right. um we know uh in this we, we're starting to talk to quite a few of them that are thinking about setting up hardship funds um they're thinking about what where their mutual aid groups sit in their in in the post COVID nineteen world, like what is the role? Is it and also it's kind of dependent. Is COVID nineteen going to come back and they're going to have to reignite the networks, or they're going to use some of the money that's in their open collectives for for other types of of um, change? And we we've, we've definitely put some applications into um, foundations to help that next stage, um, Oliver, of actually what supporting them to think through what they want. But all the way through, we have been group led. So right. at, not at any point we said, are we going to do this and then try to persuade someone to come in and take it on. We've, all, we've always responded to the groups and said, we need this, we need this. We've gone and got it for them. So we've set up um, a relationship with local giving, which means the groups can now um, fundraise on local giving, claim gift aid and put that money raised back into their open collective account. Cool. So it, it's really thinking we've been very quick yeah. yeah but yeah i mean yeah i think the key there is finding a way for them to become sustainable and evolve into something which can be ongoing i mean i think yeah. you <clears throat> you highlighted a key point there the kind of you know burnout point that you know extinction rebellion would have been very uh honest and clear to acknowledge from the outset you know after asking everybody to you know do all of them demonstrations there was a big period of like go home and rest which we haven't really had that opportunity during some of the covid times so i really hear what you said there i think that's a very sort of honest appraisal of of how things go in general and that we have to be you know we have to acknowledge and be conscious of right because you can't expect everybody to go health leather all the time like we do need to have a period of calm and i wonder then out of that yeah what they will come and conclude and, and ask for support with next like I kind of secretly hope and I think various others members of the open uh, credit network kind of hope that they might be able to think about um, trade and what I said in the introduction there like moving to towards some means of exchange with each other which doesn't necessarily involve fiat money that would be like massive uh, in my perspective yeah. yeah I mean I can't speak <clears throat> I can only speak for someone that provides a service to them. Um, so I can't say they, what they should or should be doing. Um, I can tell you that the, the time to talk about things like this is now. So it might make you happy to know, Oliver, that on Saturday I've got a meeting with all of our Brent mutual aid and finance reps. And we're, we're going to be talking about just that, like what do we what are we going to do? Do we want to set up? And I've, you know, I've sent them all the mutual credit staff, we've looked at hardship funds, um, are looking at participatory decision making and, and budgeting. So the thing is, is I think that um, 
or everyone here, you know, you're seeped in it. You've got yeah. years of experience. And then for many of these people, this is the first time they've stepped out and done something like this. Yeah. Ever, ever. They've even aware that there's a civil society, let alone something called a mutual anything. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there's, I've had a lot of late night conversations with people that have, have never really experienced um, the hardship that the, the, um, the crisis has brought or witnessed. Um, right. Uh, the discrimination that exists in in the healthcare system or seeing what you know they, they're suddenly having a big political awakening so i think there's definitely um it, it's a journey for lots of people and um it's for us it's about understanding that and being able to give for them an, enough support so they can grow with what they need where they need to yeah well i think things are going to evolve right because we've seen the kind of crisis in terms of the front line and the key workers and you know obviously people are suffering from COVID itself but i don't really think we've seen any of the ramifications in the wider economy yet like we just heard this morning that yeah in april there was 20.4 percent fall in the size of the uk economy like that's unprecedented it's never happened but if you go down the street like Tesco's is still open. Tesco's looks fine. You know, all the little shops have been forced to close. And I think, you know, it's only like this week and the forthcoming weeks that we're really going to see the impact when those shops are actually allowed to open again. I think we're going to find that quite a lot of them actually don't. And the ones that do are going to struggle and then fall because they won't be able to keep up with their rent and their rates, which, yeah, is going to cause a lot of knock on effects in the kind of local economy and then we might find that these mutual aid groups actually have a kind of very real need but a very different one to the one that they've been currently sort of working with yeah i think you're right um and uh i think that there's a leadership role for for you guys for sure in in in, in helping them join those dots um and i think that you'll you're right. And I really hope that it doesn't come to that, that it, things are so bleak that, you know, the, the only way we can get this going is by creating local mini economies. Um, but it, it might be that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I think there's other, I think what's been really interesting is that because through Open Collective, we've been able to track the nature of the spend. So we know, for example, at the beginning of the crisis, most of the transactions that were going through the site were for shopping, food, mm -hmm. And at some point, they started to shift between um, uh, food to top up, mobile phone top up, um, and gas bills and other bits and pieces. So you were starting to see it move from like immediate emergency to like maybe medium term as people needed to like work out how to work from home or all the credit ran out on their phones. So um, I think we're going to start to um, to shift again as things as people come into the mutual aid groups so yeah but it's going to be its journey i think definitely yeah. journey. we've got some questions in the chat coming through i don't know if you can see them so let's go up to well um who says esther is part as the uk is no more part of the eu well very close um are you working with partners in the eu germany who is supporting social startups the answer to that is we, as the social change agency will work anywhere but and um, we do work across europe at the moment we're working with um uk uh, climate um knowledge and information community climate kick um but um we we don't do any of the fiscal hosting work outside of the uk because of the way the banks are regulated okay right i see oh, so you have to fiscally host only uk based organizations UK-based groups. Groups. We can only because it's fiscally hosted, um, and they use our bank account. Okay. Just, we've got to be a little bit careful. There's a question from Grace, which says, "Given the crisis with COVID is symptomatic of deeper problems in society, how difficult it is is it to shift those groups from immediate response to addressing the deeper problems?" Great question. It's a good question, and I think it's. Do you think those groups are shifting anyway? I think it's the people that have come together because they could see what they were doing they, and they can see the need has shifted, so they will shift with it. I've got complete faith. We're already starting to see it to happen. Um, and I think what we would really like to do, and it's what we've put in 
funding applications for is to set up a um, almost like a peer network through all those groups across the country so they can support each other and that's that's our, our aim step by step okay I mean I think like you said yeah that's going to be a long journey right if you're if you're only sort of becoming aware of these kind of problems and some of these solutions at this point now then yeah to try and get people to think about the deeper symptomatic problems that our society and the general neoliberalist capitalist world creates might be a little bit daunting when you're still worrying where your next meal comes think, from yeah i think i would say that quite a lot of the groups already accept that that is the case okay um, i think there's quite a few people that are like this is have seen it um but so i think what's really interesting you, if you can see the screen um, you'll see the circles in the middle. What you're looking at is a movement building canvas. The yellow circle in the middle um, is what we would say is like the heart and soul of a movement and it's shared purpose uh, and shared values and shared experience. And we know the stronger those three things are in any movement, the stronger the movement is. And I think what you've got with right now across mutual aid is they've got a shared experience and they have a shared purpose, but they don't necessarily have shared values. Right. So, um, because, you know, people have come together because they care about their neighbours, not necessarily because they care about the downfall of the neoliberal, you know, um, system. So what what we, we what we would expect to see because of that is a slight kind of fracturing, as it were, as people like, actually, what is this about? So, and we would expect in the natural cadence of movement that some will fall away or some will go off and become, you know, the Judean People's Front and the People's Judean you know <laughs> see that happen and you know and that's completely natural it's a, a normal cadence of how things shift les has a question that asks are you not expanding the culture of food banks um we haven't no only because we haven't been approached um and we don't we kind of if people are doing good jobs of it then we don't need to to step in or we're not invited to go in we don't go where we're not wanted so no we haven't yeah it's just hi esther nice to uh, to meet you i'm one of the uh the coordinators of the clanidloys covid group okay. support group and uh, the fiscal yeah. hosting tool is, is working really well um talking of food banks um we do have a food bank here in clanidloys which is become incorporated into the COVID support group. There are some tensions there about where the money's being spent. Um, but I just, you know, it is an interesting point, food banks, and uh, some people think they create dependency and the sort of, I think in mm. some people it does create dependency and how we deal with that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very useful tool, and, and I'm interested in your ideas of, of taking the momentum forward and, and how we might do that. Because you know we're, we're already talking about oh, the, with the demand for the food bank, a lot of that is actually nothing to do with COVID-19. It's people that were were in distress before COVID-19 mm. and uh, mm. the potential impact of, uh, of Brexit. Um, you know, where is the the economy going yeah. to go you know so no, yeah. it's interesting isn't it so um i think what i've noticed and I i'm sure many of you um have seen the same thing that, that covid19 has it's been like a great tsunami and the waves come and it's pulled back out and we've seen the reality in front of us of what what really is it's so clear for everyone to see what is what's happened and the stark inequalities that we've we've seen stuff like your food bank you know why are people needing a food bank and where's the role of the state? <laughs> you know, that's kind of, that is their role. And there's, I think there's a really, we have a similar situation with the food bank up the road, um, literally our local food bank that's kind of, it's now existing and, and the council food bank isn't working, but the mutual aid one is. And you're like, well, actually, where is the differentiation between the state and volunteer led efforts? Because there's there is it's a really and I, I don't have an answer for it and I think it's just a question that we have to keep asking ourselves like where is where do the lines of responsibility sit? Um, but it's shown that there's been a, a really there's there's a gap in services and provision that years of cuts to local authorities have just shown up. I mean our our, C, our local CVS was decimated. It was on its knees when COVID hit. 
you know the council looked to CBS to try and support everyone and you know what what do you think was going to happen um so there's it's, it's it's really shown some hard truths that we've seen and I, I think that if you're saying that you've got you're evolving into something that is beyond an emergency response to COVID, then that is a conversation that you have to have with your with the your organising committee about your role and your purpose. Yeah, there's this, this, this issue about whether we should uh, constitute ourselves as a charity. Yeah. Obviously, we, we don't have to at the moment, but um, I, I rather think under charity law, if we continue for any length of time, delivering charitable services, and we have income this year of 10,000, would you believe, um, in, in about two, three months. Um, I'm, I'm sort of wondering whether we, we really need to register as a charity, but then you've got constitutions and yeah. so meetings, et cetera. Uh, my advice to anyone, constituting or not constituting, is hold off constituting for as long as possible, because once you've done it, <laughs> you, you're you're in it and you've got responsibilities so I mean that's why there is no law which says you have to um incorporate so you you I think you're referring to um a, if you become an unincorporated society and you raise over ten thousand pounds then you have to incorporate but right now you're not an unincorporated society you're a mutual aid group um with money coming in that's been fiscally hosted. And so I think that before you rush into any kind of constitution um, and everyone starts arguing over who's treasurer and who's chair and everything else that goes with it. And the, I'm um, trying to I, avoid, I don't want to be another treasurer. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I get it, I get it. I would just hold hold off um, and read for as long as possible till you work out your purpose. And once you've worked out your purpose, then you work out what the best kind of structure you need to be able to fulfill that purpose is. Okay, thanks for that, Esther. Cheers. Billy's got a counterpoint, which uh, seems important. Um, London Hackspace went through this process. Um, what they originally started off with uh, started off as was a private members club. A um, bunch of people who were just interested in meeting up and gossiping about technology. They were meeting up regularly within the yeah, back room of a pub for about the first about three, four months and paying uh, chipping in water subscription fees, uh, which they would which they then used to get uh, their, initial, uh, their initial place rented with room in a community centre uh, once, uh, once a week. However, um, the only reason that they incorporated was because they um, after the community centre lost its funding and they were shut that, that uh, they were having to move out, they found another uh, found an industrial unit down near Hoxton. Now, this was fine in terms of hey, we found a new place to uh, place to uh, to, put, uh, to put our workshop and put our club. However, they that was the point where they realised that they uh, they'd been running it um, explicitly from one person's own ba uh, bank account. And as uh, about that person, uh, that person looked at the rent, uh, rents that were going to be uh, that were going to be charged. And that was the point where they realised, okay, th now we need to think about incorporating uh, because it's going to be a larger amount of money than any one individual was going to be responsible for. Now they ended up using going via the limited company route because that was the quickest and simplest to set up, uh, to set up, and because most of them are from the startups uh, startup circuit. That was the route that they were used to working within. Um, if, I'd, if I'd been around, I'd have actually recommended using a cooperative uh, because it would have mean that the legal responsibility and uh, was actually spread uh, was uh, was set up in a more widespread uh, widespread uh, widespread way. But the, um, what's it? Uh, get the people together and then only incorporate as um, as you said. Um, according to when you need it, but try and do the prep work beforehand. There's large amounts of legal processes that are uh, that are that when you're setting it up, it's cheap to do, but once it's in place, it's expensive to change. Uh, which um, uh, which is why uh, spend a little time, only a little time, but um, getting your company structures and your articles and your initial rule sets set up. Uh, um, set up clearly to start with. Uh, 
And once you've got the, uh, because once and once you've got all that stuff set up, it's easy to be able to uh, set uh, be able to use those and to quickly set them up so you can uh, so you can sit there and register uh, so you can quickly uh, quickly and easily register. Yeah. However, it's ch changing them later is going to be expensive. Um, because the, uh, that's a uh, sort of major process within uh, within yeah. UK company law. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to use cooperatives or use or whatever the company structures are, there's a varieties of standard setups and, and standard rule sets that already exist, uh, and it's um, you know using uh, using one of those is going to be a lot a lot more effective. Yeah. Can I just jump in on the end of that? Um, the, I would everyone to look at the community food growers network because they were unconstituted for 20 years and managed a lot you know they did a really good job and uh, were, were decided to constitute and uh, it changed something you know they're brilliant but like we're talking to them about how the process happened um so i mean part of the fiscal hosting service we've got is so we can put that off as long as possible absolutely i'd second yeah. that we i mean to to, to jump into phil question he says hi esther what are the main challenges of being a fiscal host for another org thinking of helping in a similar way what are the good examples are there of orgs doing this role and what help does the social change agency need at the moment i think it's a brilliant question to end on there is a lot of back end work not in terms of the tech in terms of someone manually has to do some stuff they haven't quite worked out how to stop it so you're going to need a bookkeeper or someone that you trust that can go in and do all the tra back transactions it's quite fiddly and time consuming so um and the open collective they've suspended the cut the charges for using the site but they're going to come back in i think at the end of june so we're trying to communicate with them to find out what's happening um i don't know any other organization that does exactly what we do in terms of the fiscal hosting plus model um, we've got things like Prism that do the fiscal hosting, but don't do anything else. Um, and Open Cup that does some of it, but not the other bit. So um, we do some bits, but not the other bit. You know, so I think you just have to go where where you think um, it, it's be will suit your purpose. Um, and what help do we need at the moment? We're currently on a big fundraising drive, um, so we can get some more um, bodies on the ground to go and help more people. Um, that's what we need at the moment. So. Um, we're currently, we've got lots of funding bids out. There's, a, there's one more question here from Dave, uh, which says there are many local community centres and organisations, some who cross over with mutual aid group areas. Are they linking <laughs> up? Do they know about each other? This is something I've been wondering too. Yeah, um, so we 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 know uh, the ones in London because we were doing some community, we call it, we've got a strand of work in social change called Community Centred, and it's about reimagining how community centres work in the community. Um, and we've been working through them to like try and link it all together. I don't know if they know all know about each other. I assume yes, some yes, some no. And I think it's just been so busy. We just need to let the mm. dust settle a little bit and let everyone catch their breath and then be like, right, what's next? Yeah, understood. Good answer, Esther. I just want to jump back to Phil's question, just because it's a nice place to end. He asked, what help does the social change agency need at the moment? Crikey, uh, can you invent some more time in the day? <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, we definitely need, um, for us, it's more, um, it's always funding. We've constituted as a CIC to house all of our open collective work because we want it asset locked. Um, we went out of the, the for-profit business um, and um, that's that's happening now. So I think um, for us, it's literally fundraising to get all, this, all the, um, the plans we said about the peer network support going. Um, so that's that's the kind of help that we need. And I'm always interested in talking to anyone that wants to get involved um, and just so they might pop, there's loads of stuff I don't know or haven't thought of. So open okay. conversation. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you, Esther. You heard it here. Yeah, if you want to help Esther, just get in touch. I'm sure it's very easy to get in touch via the website, which is the Social Change Agency. But it's brilliant to hear your story. And yeah, we're massive fans of what you're doing. So Thank please you. do stay in touch, Esther. And um, yeah, all, all luck to you and Godspeed with your work. Thank you.